Uh, okay, cool. It's 11 o'clock. Um, I think we'll go ahead and get started. Um, sorry, before we begin, uh, I just have one thing I need to do real quick. Um, I've been working on this uh, custom controller. Uh, I was kind of hoping to have it uh, you know, done before now, uh, but it didn't. So uh, if you don't mind, I'm just gonna take a couple minutes and deploy this thing real quick. Um, cool. Uh, ah, that's gonna be a problem. Um, yeah, live demos, right? Um, See if this works. Cool, uh, we're good. Um, sorry, uh, this is a thing I've been working on. It's uh, supposed to help me out during conferences like this. Um, I called it a uh, con job. Um, it's kind of like a cron job, but it's for conferences. Any, any, anybody? <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you. All right. Um, yeah, uh, all right, let's go ahead and get started. Um, the, uh, my name's David. Uh, I am a research scientist at Applied Computing Research Labs. Um, I'm gonna be talking today about uh, running large-scale scheduling simulations using virtual kubelet. Um, so uh, let's go ahead and jump in. Uh, I wanna give you a quick overview of what applied computing is. Uh, so we're a small business doing research and development in distributed systems. Um, I'm particularly interested in scheduling and modeling and optimization. Uh, I've been doing this sort of in industry for the last eight or nine years, uh, and earlier this year uh, I decided, you know, I kind of, uh, my background's in academia, uh, I'm really passionate about open source, I kind of want to take the stuff I've been doing uh, and not do it for a company, but kind of like put it out there into the open. Um, so that's what applied computing's been doing. It's been a great journey so far. Um, I'm sure some of you know uh, when you're running a small business, uh, you have to wear a lot of different hats. Um, so uh, this is my developer hat. Uh, uh, today I wanna talk to you about a project I've been building for the last few months uh, called SimCube. Um, this is a project that uh, I initially uh, started just kind of for myself. It was a tool that I thought I was gonna need in order to uh, get to my real goal around scheduling and uh, optimization and these sorts of things. Um, but as I started chatting with more and more folks, I'm like, oh, uh, this is something that other people actually care about and are interested in as well. Uh, maybe this can be like a thing on its own. Um, so uh, to hopefully motivate this talk a little bit, uh, I wanna answer the question, why simulation? Uh, I wanna talk a little bit about what kind of simulation I actually mean, because that can uh, mean a lot of different things. Um, and to do that, I'm gonna present four different user stories. Um, so uh, first, you can imagine maybe you're an infrastructure engineer, uh, maybe there was an incident or an outage on one of your Kubernetes clusters last night. Uh, you, I don't know, you're not exactly sure what went wrong. Um, you were able to like mitigate it, you uh, deployed some stuff, uh, it, stop the bleeding, uh, but you're not really sure like, if that's a good long-term solution. You're not even entirely sure what the problem is. Wouldn't it be great if you could just capture a trace of all of the events that happened during that incident, uh, replay it on your local laptop, uh, go in, dig into the logs, dig into the metrics, uh, and really understand the problem? Um, that would be awesome, right? Uh, also, wouldn't it be great if you're like, okay, I've got this fix, uh, I think it's gonna work, um, but I'm not 100% sure. Uh, so wouldn't it be great if you could like then take that same simulation, replay it with your fix applied, and then demonstrate to your manager or to whoever that like, hey look, this actually did solve the problem. If we had had this in place, then we wouldn't have had the incident. Uh, that would be really cool. Um, so second user story, imagine that you're maybe a CI CD engineer, uh, you're responsible for all of the pipelines uh, deploying to all of your different clusters. Um, maybe you wanna make sure that people aren't introducing regressions into uh, your Kubernetes config, especially those darn infra engineers. Uh, 
And so wouldn't it be cool if, as a step in your CI pipeline, you could just run a simulation and observe particular metrics to say that, hey, look, uh, after you deploy this change to your controller or to uh, your uh, Kubernetes config, uh, things are still behaving the way that we want them to. Uh, cool, right? Uh, maybe you're a guy like me. Uh, you're really interested in scheduling. Um, you've heard about these like scheduler plugins. Uh, Cube Scheduler has like all these different parameters. You can change the parameters. Uh, you're not really sure if they like. They're they're kind of hard to reason about. Like if you make a change here, does that actually like improve your bin packing efficiency or whatever other metrics you care about? Uh, so wouldn't it be great if you could just run a simulation on your laptop, tweak these parameters, and see how your uh, cluster efficiency changes again using real production data? Um, maybe take that a step further. Maybe you even are doing like hyperparameter optimization where you feed this whole thing, this whole simulation into a ML engine that actually figures out the best scheduling parameters for you. That'd be super cool. Um, or maybe you're an ML engineer. Uh, you've got all of these batch jobs that you need to deploy. Um, Kubernetes doesn't have great primitives for running batch jobs, especially around like gang scheduling or uh, some of these like really important ML uh, you know, if you're running an LLM or diffusion model or whatever. Uh, and so you've heard of these projects, you've heard of uh, Volcano, which is an alternative scheduler for these types of batch workloads. You've heard of Apache Unicorn. Uh, there was a talk yesterday about Q, which is introducing some new primitives into the Kubernetes job. And you're like, I wanna try out these different things and just see how they work. Uh, before I deploy these into one of my clusters. Um, and wouldn't that be great if you could just kind of try out all of these things on your laptop, again, using data from your actual production systems? That'd be super cool. Um, so that's what we're gonna be talking about today. We're really focused on simulating the bits of your cluster uh, that are sort of involved in like your control plane and all of your custom controllers and objects. So we're not so much concerned with simulating the applications themselves. Uh, so this is a high-level architecture diagram of the, uh, of the project I've been working on uh, called SimCube. Um, there's kind of a lot going on here. Uh, we're gonna dig into this a little bit and hopefully like uh, explain a little more what's going on. Um, I wanna start with the uh, most important part of this diagram is me. Um, hi, I'm the problem, it's me. Uh, any, any Taylor Swift fans, no? No? Okay, um, thank you, thank you. Uh, okay, actually, that's just maybe a little bit self-centered. Uh, let's swap that out. This is you. Um, hopefully, on the last slide, I was able to motivate uh, simulations useful for everybody, uh, regardless of what your role in the company is. Uh, regardless of what you're doing, simulation can be helpful. Uh, there's something missing here. Oh, uh, you'll need a fun hat. Uh, so SimCube has six different components, which we're gonna dig into. Um, and these are highlighted in orange on this slide. Uh, again, sort of going from the previous slide, the most important bit here is the way that you, as a developer, are interacting with the system. So we've got a uh, command line utility called SK Control, or Scuttle, if you prefer, uh, that allows you to both talk to your production clusters and export data from them, and then replay that data on a simulated cluster. Um, going clockwise around the left, uh, we have this component that runs in your production clusters called SK Tracer. Uh, its job is literally just to sit there and collect data. Um, and then when you as the user say, hey, I wanna actually do some work with this data, uh, you can call Scuttle Export, it will talk to SK Tracer, and SK Tracer will save a trace to some persistent storage. Okay, um, and then once you're like, okay, now I wanna actually do something with it, uh, you can do scuttle run. Um, this talks to some components on your simulated cluster. Uh, this cluster can be, for example, a kind cluster that's running on your laptop. Um, it could be some other cluster that's maybe running in a dev environment. 
Um, on your simulated cluster, we've got a few different things that are running. Uh, SK control is a standard Kubernetes controller. Uh, it's just watching for a simulation custom resource to get posted to the cluster. Um, that custom resource, when it sees that, it's gonna spin up a driver, and the driver's job is to download the trace of the simulation and replay it on your simulation cluster. Now, the reason why this is scalable, the reason why it's possible, is these last two components. Uh, we've got SKVNode and SKCloudProv. Uh, these are components that uh, sort of mock out everything else in your cluster. Um, and so let's dive in a little bit into what these look like. So SKVNode is a virtual kubelet-based node implementation. Um, if you're not familiar, Virtual Kubelet is a project that uh, implements the Kubelet API, uh, but it allows you to wrap kind of whatever you want uh, behind that API. So there are Virtual Kubelet implementations for things like Azure Batch, uh, AWS Lambda, and it allows you to treat these things as nodes in your Kubernetes cluster. Um, in our case, uh, we're not wrapping anything. Uh, we're just pretending like we're a node uh, SKV node is gonna sit there, it's gonna listen for pod objects. When it gets a pod object, it's gonna say, hey, your pod's running, but it doesn't do anything. There's no Docker, there's no containers, there's nothing. And so you can spin up hundreds of thousands of these things just on a local laptop. It's very lightweight. Um, cool thing here is that the node properties that uh, you're simulating are configurable. So, so you can take a, uh, you can just uh, do kubectl export and then your node definition from your production cluster. You can take that config and you can apply it into your simulated cluster and voila, now your simulated nodes look exactly like the nodes in your production cluster. Um, so this is pretty cool. Um, one other thing that is important for certain types of simulations is SKV node will watch uh, annotations on your simulated pods to control their life cycle. Um, so you can, you can set a particular annotation on the pod that said this pod ran for 115 seconds, and SKV node will report that that pod's running for 115 seconds during the simulation, and then it will report that the pod terminated. Um, we'll see why that's useful in a couple slides. Uh, the other component here uh, that makes this all sort of possible is SK CloudProv. Um, this is a gRPC cloud provider for cluster autoscaler. Um, so if you're not familiar, uh, Cluster Autoscaler interfaces with you know, all the different cloud providers, but it also provides a custom interface where you can write your own. Um, and so here, we've written our own cloud provider. Uh, all it does is it talks to the deployment managing SKV node, uh, and it scales that deployment up and down. So you can see like, oh, my, uh, my, my cluster has increased or decreased the number of nodes that are running there. Okay. Um, one sort of, uh, this is, Something that not a lot of folks knew about, it's a newer feature in Kubernetes, uh, but I think it's really cool. Uh, there's a pod deletion cost feature for the replica set controller. Um, what this does is it allows you to set an annotation on pods, and the replica set controller will delete pods that have lower cost first. And so the way that this works is, you know, Cluster Autoscaler has to be able to specifically terminate uh, you know, this node. Uh, it doesn't want to terminate nodes that have running pods on it. And so the way that we implement that in our simulated cluster is we annotate the nodes or the pods that we want to terminate with this pod deletion cost. Okay. Uh, these slides are available online. Um, there's a bunch of clickable links on here. So if you want to download these after the talk uh, or right now and go get some more information, you can do that as well. Cool. Um, so that's sort of on the simulation side. Now I want to take a look at the uh, production side. What is actually going on inside of SK Tracer? Um, so SK Tracer literally is just a pod that sits on your production cluster and it puts a watch on the API server uh, for resources and pods. Um, you can configure it to watch any type of resource that you want, uh, deployments, replica sets, stateful sets, whatever you want. Um, you can also configure it to watch any sort of custom resource. So, uh, you know, if you're running Volcano or if you've got your own custom controller and CRD, you can configure SK Tracer to watch those as well. Uh, and all it's doing is it's recording a timeline of important events. Um, what do I mean by important events? Well, these are any time that uh, these objects change in a way that might be relevant to the simulation. So I've got a couple examples here. Um, on the left, you can see that uh, there's a deployment. Uh, maybe the deployment is created at time zero. 
shortly thereafter, you know, it spins up a, a replica set underneath the hood, and then that replica set spins up a pod. Um, that pod, pod A, runs for a short period of time, um, and then maybe something, a human operator or HPA decides, uh, oh, this deployment needs to scale up. It increases the number of replicas, uh, and then it creates two more pods, pods B and C. So SK Tracer, what it's watching for is it observes that the deployment was created. Uh, it then observes that pod A was started, and it's able to attach pod A back to that deployment. Um, and then it observes that the replicas for the deployment changed uh, sometime later. Uh, it records that event, and it also records that uh, pods B and C got attached back to the deployment as well. Um, and so then it's able to take all this stuff and replay it later on. Another example here is maybe you've got a cron job. It's running things periodically. Uh, and so here we've got an example. Pod one runs for some period of time, then pod two runs, then pod three runs. Uh, this is where your lifecycle annotations become important because when you want to simulate a cron job, uh, these aren't long running things. So you need to know if you're going to run the simulation, you need to know this pod started and then it ended. Uh, and so you're able to, uh, SK Tracer is able to capture that lifecycle information and record it so that it can be fed back into our simulation. Okay. Cool. Uh, so let's move on. Um, okay. Uh, this is this is a little embarrassing. I, I just got myself paged in the middle of my talk. Um, okay, hang on. Uh, saying something, one second. Uh, saying something about uh, there's a bunch of pods impending. Uh, this doesn't really seem like um, my issue. Uh, I'm gonna, sorry, I'm gonna go ahead and just reassign this to one of our infrastructure engineers. Uh, maybe they can, maybe they can deal with it. The server's on fire. I saw like several of you like visibly flinch. I hope I didn't. I hope I didn't like uh, impose any undue trauma here. Uh, one sec. Um, okay, hi. Uh, I'm David. Uh, I'm one of the infrastructure engineers at Applied Computing. Uh, this is my infrastructure engineering hat. Um, I just got paged for this thing. Uh, as an aside, I'm really frustrated with our developer. Like, he just kind of YOLOs stuff out to production. He doesn't test anything. Um, so anyways, uh, we're gonna have a chat after this is over, but maybe this is an opportunity to uh, kind of uh, talk about uh, some of uh, the tools that I've been discussing here. Um, let me see. Let me see if this is working. It may not be working. That would be disappointing. Let me switch over to our... Oh, you know what? I don't have the port forwarding set up. Probably. Nope, it's already working. Hey, live demos, right? Um, okay, let me see. Maybe the Grafana dashboard isn't working. Let me see what else I can show you here uh, that isn't Grafana. Um, okay. Uh, so it turns out actually the controller that I deployed at the beginning of the talk is not running anything at all. So uh, I don't know what's up with our pager duty config. Um, let's do this. I'm going to skip the live demo um, and I'm going to talk a little bit about what you might have seen uh, if the demo were working. Um, so. Uh, as I mentioned, um, we do have a command line utility that uh, allows you to talk to the various pods here. Um, let me just see. Let me just see uh, if I can figure out what's going on. One second. Uh, 
Okay. Um, what I'm going to do, actually, uh, we're going to skip all of that. Uh, we're just going to go back to uh, this diagram here. I'm going to tell you a little bit about what's going on inside of SK Control and SK Driver. Um, so what's happening here is when uh, you post this custom resource into the uh, into your simulated cluster. Um, We've got a controller that's watching for this thing. It does some initial config, and then it launches this driver. Uh, the way that the driver works is uh, it's got two components. Um, it's got a simulation runner, um, and the runner itself is, uh, it downloads the trace object that we talked about previously, um, and then it uh, replays that trace. Uh, so it's just able to look at all of the, all of the data in the trace, and, um, apply it to the API server in your simulated cluster. Um, the other bit that is part of the SK driver is the, it's, it installs a mutation webhook. Um, and the reason for that is whenever pods get created in the simulated cluster, I want to redirect them so that they're uh, getting replayed onto uh, the simulated nodes. Um, and so your mutating webhook, uh, it intercepts all of the pods, checks to see if it's part of the uh, simulation, and then it applies particular labels, tolerations, annotations, um, and then it also is applying those pod lifecycle annotations as well. And so um, it's able to sort of track uh, throughout the life cycle of your simulation, you know, these pods belong to this simulated object, they're supposed to run for this period of time, and all of that information just kind of seamlessly happens in the cluster. Um, so this is pretty cool. Um, let me see. Uh, if there's one other thing I can show you here, uh, cool. So I want to show you uh, what the trace object actually looks like. Um, so when you run Scuttle export, uh, this is what this is what gets saved. Um, so uh, here we have uh, at the beginning, uh, we're just saving sort of the config that uh, we configured SK Tracer with, um, and then the important bits here. Uh, the important bits here is, uh, are these timeline objects. So you can see uh, there's kind of an initial marker uh, in the trace uh, that says the simulation started at this time. Um, and then from then on, uh, it records timestamps of interesting events. So we can see here uh, at a particular timestamp, it uh, applied some objects. Um, and we're literally just saving the, uh, it's kind of a sanitized version of the raw Kubernetes YAML, or the raw Kubernetes manifest. Um, and then we can keep going down here. Uh, at some later point in time, uh, that same object then got deleted. Um, and so this is what it looks like. Uh, it's all saved in a binary format that's JSON-esque. Uh, it's, I think, reasonably efficient, and so it doesn't take up a ton of storage. Um, but this is, you know, now, you, now this is what gets downloaded and replayed. Um, so what I'm going to do is let's move on. I want to spend a little bit of time talking about what are next steps. Um, you can all imagine that I gave you a really fascinating demo. Uh, can I have some applause for my demo? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and there was a hat, so you know you didn't leave completely disappointed. Uh, let's talk a little bit about what I want to do next here. Um, so one thing that I think is really important is being able to actually compare and visualize these results. Uh, right now, uh, you can replay this stuff, and you can look at it on Grafana or whatever your monitoring tool of choice is, uh, which is great. Uh, like, I love Prometheus. I love Grafana. Um, but it lacks some of the more data analysis type of uh, features that I want to be able to do. You can imagine being able to take two of these simulations and maybe compare a diff, um, or uh, like what is the you know what is the mean scheduling time, or what is the mean like uh, cluster efficiency, or something along those lines. Um, being able to answer those types of questions is really important and. I would say that it's something that in the Kubernetes ecosystem, like, we're kind of lacking those tools right now. 
Um, there was an interesting Grafana talk yesterday uh, where they were demonstrating some features around, uh, not for simulation, uh, but demonstrating some new visualization tools, which I thought was really interesting, so maybe check that one out. Um, but I think there's a lot of really interesting kind of greenfield work to be done here. Um, another thing that I really want to be able to do is, uh, right now what you can do is you can take a trace from your production cluster and then you can replay it. Um, this is, you know, I think really useful. Uh, what I want to be able to do is start answering what if questions. So not just like, well, this happened, but like, what if this happened? What if we had a deployment that scaled up to 10,000 pods? What if we, uh, you know, we're running this ML thing and one of the jobs terminates? Like, how does the cluster respond? Uh, so I think there's a lot of work that we can do around being able to take these trace objects and modify them, or even like generate completely hypothetical traces, uh, and then apply those in a simulated cluster and see what happens. I think that that could be a really powerful, uh, really powerful thing. Um, there's also, there's a ton of duplicated effort that's being done right now. So I don't know if you're familiar with Quark. Uh, Quark is Kubernetes without Kubelet. Uh, they have a very similar setup to me. They don't have all of the tracing and replay components, but SKV node, SK CloudProv, they have their equivalent thing over there. Um, there's actually two Quark talks happening at KubeCon. Uh, one of them's happening right now, so if you're here, uh, sorry, I guess you missed that one. Um, maybe they have a better live demo. Um, there's another one tomorrow uh, about doing large scale, uh, like scalability testing using Quark. That's tomorrow at 2 p.m. I uh, really encourage you to check that out. Um, there are other projects as well, like KCP is the Kubernetes control plane. Um, it's just running the control plane. It doesn't have any of the kubelet stuff behind it. Uh, virtual kubelet, of course. Um, there's things like kubemark, where they have their hollow node implementation. Uh, so there's a ton of duplicated work here uh, that I really think that, like, let's stop duplicating all this stuff and, like, kind of, like, let's settle on one thing. Um, and kind of, I'm kind of hoping that maybe SimCube can be a part of that. Um, the last bullet point here is a little bit interesting. Uh, so one thing I didn't tell you is about half of the stuff here is written in Rust. Um, maybe that's exciting to you. Maybe that's like, oh my God, what is he thinking? Uh, when I started this project, it was, you know, a thing that I thought I wanted. And so this was an opportunity for me to learn, learn some Rust, uh, learn a little bit about the Kubernetes ecosystem around Rust. Uh, side note, uh, the KubeRS project is fantastic. I love it. Um, but uh, as more and more folks have you know, demonstrated interest, I recognize uh, that might uh, be a hindrance to adoption. Um, so I'm not committing to this, but maybe uh, there's a Golang rewrite in the cards. Uh, re uh, R R I G, yeah, uh, rewrite it and go. Um, if, you're interest, if that's something that's of interest to you, I'd love to hear more about your use case. Um, I don't have, I'm not making any solid promises there. Um, there's also, there's a ton of other work to be done. Um, as I mentioned kind of at the beginning of the talk, uh, we're an open source first company. Uh, everything we do is kind of out in the open, so I would love to have more contributors to this project. Um, I got my first PR this morning, which is super exciting. Uh, if you're interested in contributing to SimCube uh, or you want to use it in one of your clusters, uh, or maybe if you're interested in like sponsoring some of the work that you're doing, uh, I would love to talk with you. Um, I'm around the rest of the conference. Um, this is also my website is on these slides. Uh, you can email me. Um, I would love to get in touch and kind of know more about your use case and if the stuff that I'm building is uh, helpful for you. Um, this is pretty much all that I have today. Uh, I'm happy to take any questions. There's also a bunch of links on here. Again, these slides are available. Um, so you can see the code on GitHub. All the artifacts for this presentation are on GitHub. So you could go run the demo yourself if you wanted to. Um, I have a blog where I publish thoughts about whatever I feel like writing about approximately weekly. So you can go sign up for that. Um, and then I'm also on Mastodon. Uh, so if you wanna go follow me on there, uh, that would be great. Um, I am happy to take any questions that you all have, and thanks so much for putting up with my uh, dumb jokes.
Um, I think there, there's a microphone over there. So uh, for folks who are watching online, if we can uh, use the microphone, that would be great. Uh, no? I think it's on. Oh, there we go. Oh, hello? Yep. Hello? Okay. Um, we're actually uh, have a use case around simulation, um, and I wanted to ask you a couple of questions about the data that you're collecting. Mm -hmm. So um, I work for IBM. We, we need scenarios that we could simulate some very large clusters. Mm -hmm. And specifically, but I think I think I can see hints of this, uh, we need to simulate some complex pod-to-pod -pod affinity, anti-infinity mm -hmm. rules. Mm -hmm. So in, in the you know, uh, slim down manifest, I, it looked like that we were going to be able to pick that up, right? If I Yep. And, and so the virtual kublet will then position these virtual pods then yep. based on the affinity, anti-infinity. The, this, so I think that's a that's a plus. Um, we are looking at Quark also, and for us, one of the drawbacks is I actually need some other metrics mm. other than the container spec. So mm -hmm. uh, you know, in a real world, I would I could talk to the kubelet and and get some metrics, but right. I want to capture a snapshot of that and also send that as a payload. Right. Do you think that's possible? Yeah. Um, one of the things I that I want to be able to do, uh, so right now I'm just capturing like when your pod started and ended. Uh, it would be totally possible to inject other annotations, like uh, your init containers took this long to run, like your sidecar container exited with this exit code. Uh, we could feed all of those sorts of annotations in and then, yep. Yep, yep. Um, I think the, I'm starting small. I don't know what other metrics folks are going to be interested in, and I don't want to just capture everything. Um, but certainly, we, there's a lot more we can do there. <laughs> OK. Um, are you currently pulling in any kind, like, any information about like node startup times and things like that? So like putting into the simulation of like, my, if, if I improve my like 99th percentile for how long a node takes to spin mm -hmm. up, how does that impact my simulations? Uh, so right now I'm not pulling that information in. Uh, when your node, it, the simulation will just report that the node comes up immediately. Uh, again, you can inject all of that information in and have virtual kubelet kind of fake it out. Um. Uh, hi, <clears throat> my name is Indiga. Uh, so the, my question is now, since you have the trace, can we do kind of like a replay? Like, you know, the, like some incidents happen on the production cluster or mm -hmm. like any testing cluster now. If we want to replay on this one and try to debug, okay, what's actually mm -hmm. went through? Like, can we do that with this trace? Yep. Uh, so you can, you can do the uh, replay on kind of whatever cluster you want. As long as you have this SK controller running there, uh, you can then tell it to uh, replay the trace. And that could be on a local cluster that's running on your laptop. It could be in a cluster that's in a dev environment. It could be on some other production cluster, I guess, if you wanted to. Um, but you should be able to do that anywhere. Okay, so that means we can pick the date and time from the, the production cluster you want to trace. Mm -hmm. Okay. Exactly. Yeah, thank you. Any other questions? Okay, um, we'll go ahead and stop there. Uh, thank you so much for coming. Uh, really great to see all of you here. Um, would love to chat more uh, after the talk as well. So thanks again. <laughs>